Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Francesca Happe. I'm the director of the SGDP, where you are now, and I've been involved in autism research for almost 30 years, which makes me feel very old. It makes me realise I am very old. But it gives me great pleasure to um, be chairing this session, um, and I will just um, ask each of the speakers, please, to introduce themselves, <coughs> say something about themselves, say something about maybe what they feel about this topic or why it's important to them. So um, I'll just go in the order from closest to me. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Cos Michael. Um, Cos, do you want to just say a few words? Okay, I'm Cos. I was uh, diagnosed uh, as autistic about eight, nine years ago when I was 50. Um, that's a giveaway. And um, yeah, I went to work for the NAS, starting off their autism and aging um, uh, work stream and since leaving I've been involved with participatory research on various levels. I, I mentor uh, a neuroscientist in Edinburgh. I am a consultant on a project in Newcastle and a researcher on another project in Newcastle and I've been involved, I was one of the, the people who wrote to Georgia Pavlopoulou uh, about sleep, and I was instrumental in, in helping get together that uh, um, survey that came out. Um, very briefly, in Newcastle, I was invited to be part of the uh, adult autism and aging cohort as a consultant, and I went up there and discovered that by consultant, what they meant was they created an agenda they created uh, research uh, surveys uh, and every four months uh, three autistic people were invited up to talk to them about how to talk to autistic people, how to word the, the surveys, how to word questions, how to go about interviewing. And I suddenly realised that I was nothing to do with the research. I, I wasn't a tick box, but I was nothing to do with the research, so I complained. So when they started another project very recently, um, to their credit, they listened. I'm now a researcher on that project. I have input into it. I would urge anybody who's autistic and wants to be involved to complain if you're invited to tick a box um, because it worked for me. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Cos. That's really, really helpful background. Um, and next, can I introduce Rebecca Wood? Rebecca, would you say a few words about yourself and, and this topic? Will do. Um, well, I'm a former teacher, I was a mainstream teacher, and then subsequent to that I became, I suppose, an autism practitioner for want of a, a better term. Um, and the reason why I mention that is because at that time, which was before I started my PhD, um, I always felt it was very important to have autistic children uh, involved as part of that uh, training that I ran. Um, I've been to lots of different sort of training sessions myself as a practitioner and often people would sort of talk the talk and then go off and, and sort of carry on as before. And I don't mean by that autistic children in the training but that there would be a follow through to practice with uh, autistic children. Um, I've recently completed a PhD in autism education where my focus was on the inclusion of autistic children in mainstream primary schools and as part of that I had 10 autistic child participants and also 10 autistic adult participants, um, with my focus obviously particularly on the children. Um, and that was incredibly interesting and uh, invaluable, actually. Um, uh, during that time, I was also employed on the Transform Autism Education Project, which Damien was also working on. Um, and as part of that role, um, both of us tried to push very hard to uh, include more autistic people in that project, and in fact, the involvement of, of autistic people in that project has ended up being one of the main outcomes uh, of, of, the, of the project overall. Um, and at the moment, I'm also writing a book. I've been commissioned by Jessica Kingsley to write a book based on my PhD. Um, and I have 10 autistic uh, contributors for that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So um, next, could I ask you, Brett, to, Brett Heisman, to introduce yourself and say a bit about the topic? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, sp I spoke earlier. so. Uh, as you know, I'm a, I was a carer before doing my uh, psychology degree um, for a young autistic man. And um, as you saw earlier with my exhibition, I've done one very large participatory project. Um, I think I have an outstanding uh, concern that there are many discourse constraints within academia which kind of prevent participatory activities from happening. 
Um, and uh, I certainly think that creativity, um, doing new things, uh, is very important in order to engage with uh, uh, diversity. Um, so uh, other types of things I've been doing, um, I don't know, you might have seen, uh, I've been trying to translate my research into animations to make it more accessible. Um, I've uh, done some augmented reality stuff, which uh, Laura's seen. I've made a little virtual me that you can hold in the palm of your hand and uh, gives a, a lecture. Um, <laughs> these are all things I'm doing to procrastinate from submitting my PhD. Uh, so uh, that's me. Thank you, Brett. And the fourth member of our panel is Damien Milton. Damien, would you say a few words? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my interest in participation in knowledge production uh, probably goes back about as far as I can remember as an interest. Uh, certainly since I began in academia even as a student and this was a long long time before I knew that I was autistic or what autism officially referred to. Um, and my initial background in academia was in sociology and philosophy as subjects and uh, there's a bit of a mission of mine that all academic work should be more participatory with the people they were researching upon. And it's probably because I felt the kind of experience and knowledge in my head wasn't really being reflected much in the outside world or what I was reading and so on. Uh, I first uh, became very aware of autism when my son was diagnosed at the age of two. Um, and I started to self-identify as being on the spectrum. And then after losing a job as a FE lecturer, I got diagnosed uh, about nine years ago in a building just over there at the Mortley. So. Um, and uh, so a lot of my work since then really has been around this topic. I often speak about it and write about it. Um, and how to improve it. So one of the things I do is uh, chair a network called the Participatory Autism Research Collective. So the whole point of that network is to promote participation and participatory ethos and methods and so on and to share ideas. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we now have um, lots of time for questions from all of you, um, questions you might want to ask now from the audience, some questions that have been sent in already that I'll um, take occasionally, and there may be questions that come in via Twitter uh, that I guess Laura will feed into the discussion. So who would like to be brave and start off with a question to the panel? Yes. Hi. Um, there seems to me like uh, uh, some real um, barriers, systemic barriers in academia to collaborative and participative research. Um, and as a PhD researcher, a PhD candidate or whatever, and previous as a master's candidate, um, it, it seems like there are more barriers in place than there are um, facilitations to doing collaborative research on lots of different levels. Um, and so one ends up almost being obliged cause to fall into what you were saying just now. And I was wondering concretely, what advice as a panel would you give to people who are doing PhD research faced with the disabling um, system, it's basically a disabling system around collaborative research within academia, what would be the best starting place? You know, what can you do within those constraints? Um, panel, would it be helpful to, if the questioner gave an example of some of the particular barriers that they're thinking of, or is that pretty... I, I was going to give examples. Okay, fantastic. Why don't, you, why don't you kick off then, in that case? Brett, right, that would be great. Yeah, I, I agree that it's, um, there are significant constraints. Uh, when you think about it, it's not at all conducive to uh, engaging with autism, the way that academia is structured, the way that knowledge is produced. Uh, articles are written at a very high level of sophistication, which may disadvantage autistic people who are already disadvantaged by the educational system. They're published uh, behind paywalls, 
which again probably disadvantages autistic people who have had difficulty finding employment. Um, and uh, it's not what you would, they would call uh, dialogical. You know, you, you get to the point of publishing a paper and then researchers move to the next paper. There's no feedback process. There's no uh, taking the findings back to the people or the communities you research to identify uh, the best avenues for further research. So it's not an open system of knowledge exchange. It's a closed system. It's mostly academics talking to other academics. So uh, those are some of the systemic challenges. Um, yeah. Do you, Do you want to say something about how we might address them? Yeah, so I mean, the, the way I've been addressing it, I mean, I'm sure there are other ways of doing it, but uh, blogging has been uh, vital for me because it's free, it's written in a way that's accessible, uh, it's easy to share, and people leave comments. So it's inherently dialogical. You can respond to what people say to the things you write in the blog. Uh, and in fact, um, two blogs I've written during my PhD uh, have, have ended up being circulated quite a lot and opening up really important dialogue about um, autism in the workplace, um, which itself is, um, you know, absolutely changing the direction in which uh, I would uh, go as a researcher. So uh, blogs are definitely one tool that are uh, underutilised. Fantastic. Cos, I think you... I, I think there are a couple of um, starting points. One is money. Um, most uh, researchers don't have a budget for uh, autistic participation and autistic people are not the charity. Um, so now some, uh, I think Autistica are doing it now, uh, where they require participation and it needs to be factored in when, when you take a grant. And so when you've got a, a senior uh, academics who, who are averse to participation from the other, uh, which is us, um, it I think is, is quite a good incentive to say, well, then you can't have the money. Um, and I think the more, the more that that happens, the better. The other thing is in the, the actual researchers' own um, internal problems. You, you want to research, you want to research with autistic people. You may not know autistic people. You don't know how, how necessarily to go about it. There's some very, very clunky attempts out there of, of engagement. Um, to which my, my thing is, I really like the mentoring system where if you want to know how best to talk to autistic people, ask autistic people. If you want to find out how to engage with autistic people, again, use social media, say, I'm interested in researching this sort of area within autism. Uh, is there anybody out there who would be interested in talking to me um, about their experience and possibly keeping a watching brief that I'm doing it in a way that is respectful and inclusive. Uh, and hopefully we can get together and, and get you some funding to be part of the process and building that way. Thank you. Becky. Um, well, two things really. Um, first of all, as, as I think has already been mentioned today, um, I think it's important that if you uh, want to have autistic people uh, as co-collaborators and co-participants, it's important that that's planned in from the get-go uh, and not something that's bolted on. And therefore, that might mean uh, thinking differently about how you run things, the structures, the meetings, the communication, etc. Um, the other thing that I would say is, uh, because I'm particularly interested in this area, is to really think about communication and how people feel comfortable communicating and how you can communicate with them. I see that as being absolutely key to trying to increase the diversity of uh, autistic people, uh, adults and children in, in research. Thank you. Damien. Yeah, apart from the obvious problems of finance, funding, how the systemic problems there and publishing, uh, and the culture in academia and how that creates barriers and there's the ref system and all of that. But there's also kind of academic silos, so disciplines not talking to one another or not knowing how and that uh, talk of interdisciplinary work which never really seems to happen. I was talking to a friend in a different school in the university the other day just the other day, and on their desk they had a school of arts 
mug on the, and they, we were talking about this sense of belonging to your school and even within universities. So there's systemic barriers all over the place. But then what I say is uh, rebel a bit, uh, even if it's a little bit. Um, it's, uh, for me, I have little choice but to throughout life, so I've become quite an expert at somehow surviving and rebelling at the same time within the system. Uh, but I'm not the only one. Uh, if you look at in the more scientific area in the field of autism, I'd like to highlight people like Michelle Dawson, Dorothy Bishop, uh, people who have pointed out poor practice by other scientists openly on social media and in press and so on. This is highly important to hold each other to account, which uh, I don't see enough of, uh, bluntly. That's uh, something we can do more of, is just have that integrity as academics and uh, stand by that. And within that, uh, build these communities and networks we've been talking about, stuff like Park and Discover and the rest of it, so that we can build on the positives and uh, look out for some of the sharks in the water, so to speak. Thank you. I'd add um, John Brock to another yeah, notable John Brock as well, yeah. critic so of other scientists very very, in a very constructive way. Yes, question there. How do you engage the autistics that are harder to engage? Uh, not just the one online uh, doing uh, surveys over Twitter, but the minorities, the people that are nonverbal. I mean, the, the other half, as per use, talk at Outscape, uh, the ones that are not usually involved in research. Excellent question. How to engage those whose voices often aren't heard? Damien. Um, yeah, this is a a big topic for me, I think, personally, because um, I'm always wanting to push this agenda f further forward for the last few decades, as it were. And so these topics are close to my heart right now. And I think there is a lot of good work in working with uh, less verbal autistic people and those with learning disabilities and so on. Um, especially in design, uh, work of Wendy Keybright, Chris Fraunberger. There's uh, some really interesting creative work. Some of the kind of stuff Brett's been talking about is the kind of thing we need to do a lot more of uh, with this group, acti creative activities and engaging uh, ways. And that takes a kind of very different approach to research, which is more like in the field of design they're used to, and scientists are less used to. Um, so it's kind of spreading those methods. Also with uh, different minority groups, things like that, um, soon I'm going to be chairing an event which I'm quite honoured to be invited to do, really, around uh, black and ethnic minority and autism and participation around that. Um, and in a sense, that's through making effort. It's engaging with different communities and trying to build bridges and bonds between different groups and build these networks, as we say. Um, if you don't make that effort, the, sort of, the mountain won't come to Mohammed, as it, this old phrase <laughs> goes. So, um, and I think there's people in different communities making that effort, and it's finding out who those people are and working with them to build this up over time. Thank you. Becky? Um, I, th I think it's a, a huge problem in autism research and I don't think there are any easy answers, actually, to try and really increase the range of people um, who are engaged with that. I think it should at least be an aim. 
Um, if I just share my own experience, though, from the point of view of uh, conducting research with autistic children, um, two of the children in, in, out of the ten children that I had working with me were described as nonverbal, although actually they weren't nonverbal, um, and they all had some sort of difficulty with speech. Um, and I found that I had to be quite flexible. Um, I had to submit additional applications for ethical <coughs> review, for example, to sort of um, you know, respond to the circumstances that I was in with, with the children, how they presented and all this kind of thing. Um, use different methods and also seed control. That was actually quite an important thing. The more I seeded control towards them and let them sort of uh, run things in their own way, the more they communicated and expressed themselves. Some, some of them expressed themselves in other ways. One boy, for example, he um, didn't want to do an interview. He wanted to show me his action hero moves. Um, and, and this was actually quite important for him uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, other people, uh, one person gave me a photograph, for example. Um, so it's really important that from a methodological point of view, you use you know, multiple ways of engaging. Thank you. Klaus, did you have? I, I think there's also the, the problem with silo mentality between uh, large organizations that that could open doors. Uh, for instance, mental health charities uh, and autism charities, uh, so that you can't, you, it's very difficult to get them to work together because a lot of people have more than one um, disability, if you like, uh, or, or condition. Um, so if you've got people who are, uh, for instance, have a, an intellectual disability, um, they may be... A, a, associated with, with a charity that you may not have access to or may not have thought of accessing. Uh, networking can also go, go through um, various health services. Um, if, you, if you have the uh, resources to do things like poster uh, or work through um, health services. So networking that way is very useful. The black and ethnic minority, um, I mean, nearly everyone in this room isn't a member of. Uh, like Damien, I, I, I go down nearly every year to uh, a second voice who do an autism fair in, in sort of Lambeth area. Uh, and, and that is a black and ethnic minority run group. It's also a church associated group. Well, I'm not associated with a church, never mind their church, and I'm not a member of the black and ethnic minority. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. If, if we talk to other people, other people get to talk to us, and it breaks down that barrier that, that says uh, the big charities aren't for us. We don't see ourselves reflected there. And I think we really, really need to be very aware of that because otherwise that part of the community is being failed um, by the very people who don't want to fail autistic people and I think that's a really important thing to factor in uh, to get that sort of range. Thank you, Cos. Brett? Uh, yeah, just to build on that, uh, definitely the spaces in which academia happens is um, a factor in trying to make um, things more accessible to hard to reach populations, even by virtue of having an event, you know, in an institution that's already a barrier to people with from a lower socioeconomic status. So uh, definitely part of the equation in terms of trying to reach um, uh, diverse populations and hard to access uh, populations is by doing creative projects and going to different uh, areas and communities. Um, so uh, I think we need to think critically about the spaces in which we, we do these events as well. I've also um, heard from colleagues how difficult it is to go and work with individuals, adults with autism, with um, significant intellectual disability who are, for example, in care homes, that the doors to these places are very much shut and very much protected, probably for reasons that are, are not good reasons. Um, and I think that's a real problem too, and I think we need a piece of work around that to open up um, those communities to, to be involved in research in every way. Um, more questions? Sorry. Another comment. Yeah. Um, what Frank just was talking about uh, relates to what Becky said earlier, this word control. And it's uh, 
often is said about autistic people, especially certain so-called subtypes, this need to control. <laughs> well, there's a need to control for charities, a need to control for scientists, especially for standardized measuring and all the rest of it. And that runs against flexibility. And so um, there's a tension there between who's controlling what and a power dynamic, which Becky also mentioned. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask if you think um, there's a place of for participatory research in any type of autism research, and if so, how can we turn uh, sort of less readily uh, obvious research, like cognitive or very methodological research, to be more participatory? How can we, what sort of steps can we take to change that? Yes. <laughs> Does anyone mind if I go? Uh, there's, um, yes, I think efforts can be made across the entire academic spectrum, as it were. Um, as uh, Brett said earlier, it's an ethos, and so my general thing is just try harder, do more of it across the board. It is going to improve things. Um, with more scientific research, I think, especially at the very start and the end of projects, there needs to be a lot of input, and throughout to make sure the ethics and everything's being done on that front and inclusively, but just on what topic to study in the first place, how to, and then at the end, how to disseminate, how to share this knowledge in a respectful way. So even in the most hard science objective RCT type research, there's still room for more participation. Then there's, um, on that opening bit, what to test in the first place, all this exploratory research needs to be invested in more in participatory methods than what we've been talking about. So then, by the end of these processes, you might come up with a prototype product or service or something then you can put that through an RCT. So all of this work needs to link up with the big funders' projects, and it all needs to link up. At the moment, I really don't see that happening. It, I just see a free-for-all capitalist competition. So. Okay. Next, Brett. Um, yeah, it's sort of, again, picking up on what Damien said. Um, there's kind of just a widespread challenge with academia that it has quite a narrow sense of what dissemination is it tends to use what they call the conduit metaphor model of communication so the idea that uh, disseminating is transmitting um, a message from point a to point b from the specialist to the non-specialist and that's not um that's not dissemination um that's not understanding you know the different stakeholders uh that would have an interest in what you're researching, and it's not uh, creating dialogue from which you can learn and develop directions for future research. So even if you're uh, you know, very cognitive or neuroscience, um, it, there's still the opportunity at the point of publication to work very hard to translate that into something that's accessible. Uh, and something that uh, you can then get feedback about, you know, what is the real world validity of uh, the things that we're exploring here. And so that process, it's not, you know, specific to autism, it's academia in general, but uh, I think at the very least, uh, research designs can be participatory in that sense. So we should think about engagement, not dissemination as yeah. that's the key word. Cos? Well, I, I, I take a completely non-academic viewpoint on this one. If an academic is creative enough to wanting to work with somebody who, <coughs> who has uh, communication difficulty. If you're creative enough to find a way to get them to participate in what you want, then you're creative enough to find a way to get them to participate in what they want, frankly. Conversation is a two-way street. It's not just us learning to communicate with you, you've got to learn to communicate with us. And if you can do it so that we can feed into your research, then you're just as capable of doing it to help us feed into your research, okay? And that's all. That's, that's my attitude to communication. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Becky, anything to add? Um, just a couple of things, really. Um, as Jamie mentioned and was also mentioned this morning, it's about um, keeping uh, the sort of pressure on, I suppose, in, in terms of identifying what the priorities are. What are the priorities of, of autism research? Is it endless? Um, you know, sort of scientific genetic research or, or is there other research needed as well? Um, and Jamie mentioned uh, Michelle Dawson. Uh, I'm a huge fan of her work myself and, and Lawrence Mottran. Um, I think what's really interesting about some of their work is that they challenge some of the basic assumptions of other scientifically driven research. And they, you know, have this extremely meticulous research themselves that comes to quite different conclusions sometimes. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that I've got questions in front of me that came in electronically and a lot of them have been covered already. Um, there's a question about which says, how do you consider the different models or types of participation? For example, PPI, um, participant uh, and, what's that saying? PPI, participant and the, anyway, um, panel, mentor. <coughs> Or, which has been mentioned by uh, COS, collaboration throughout the research process, including write up as a co author. So, how do you consider those different models, and is there a hierarchy of what we should be aiming for? Or could you comment on when you think it's better to use different types depending on the research? So, anything any of you want to add to what's already been said about that? Yes. Uh, aim upwards on that kind of ladder of participation people often use. So, if you're not doing anything in terms of a participation, get a aut an autistic person in, get a mentor in. Then if you get that established, what can you do next? Uh, work up advisory groups, collaborations, build your own networks. Um, and I think things like co-authoring and being members of research teams is what I want to see. Um, I'm still seeing applications come in that I'm now reviewing, which is great fun, because I can criticize them for not doing enough of this. Um, and so having members on research teams, qualified people, or if they're not qualified, how can you help them become more qualified in research so they're becoming more of an expert in what you're doing? Um, so they're not just sat as an advisor forever, as it were. So you're learning from them, but they're also learning and gaining from you and that experience and gaining knowledge that they can then use. Um, so basically, what I'd like to see is autistic researchers, artists, designers, as full team members on interdisciplinary collaborative projects. It's a nice uh, pig flying across there. <laughs> but uh, on the way there, it's taking steps towards that, basically. Thank you. That, that's also a helpful answer to um, a different question, which is where an early career researcher might start first. So you've pointed to the steps the on the ladder. Step. Take the first step, but then always look upwards. Yes, Carl. There's also the fact that not everybody, uh, because they're autistic, is, is articulate um, and engaged uh, at an academic level or wanting to be, uh, a point. lot of people lack the confidence uh, to do that. Um, and yet, yet they're just as valid as autistic people and need to be included. And I, and I think sometimes uh, inviting people into smaller group situations, possibly inviting them to bring somebody with them to give them the confidence in travel, in arrival, in going home afterwards, uh, things like that can help to bring in people who might not normally have the confidence to participate, the focus won't be on them, um, the demand is lessened by that, and it also builds self-esteem just to be invited. Even if you say no the first time, you might say yes the second time. So I would, I would suggest that's a way of bringing in uh, people who are able to contribute, but not necessarily um, at, uh, at, with great articulacy um, at the level that you might want as an academic researcher on an academic level. But, but in order to uh, be involved, to contribute, but in their own way, um, and it's up 
to academics to also consider that their way is as good a way sometimes. Thank you, Cos. And, and that also speaks to our previous point about involving a wider uh, membership of individuals in this. And I think also from my experience, sometimes individuals who might come along to that event and then give you comments later when they've had time to process or when they can process it offline outside the demands of the social situation. Yeah, there's a, there's a very small sort of clique uh, of us autistic people who seem to meet each other going round all the conferences, going round all, all, all the universities. It needs to be broadened. Mm. You know, I want, to, I want to sort of put myself out of work here by saying bring in more people. Yes, absolutely. Damien? A um, point that links that is I completely agree with everything Cos just said and I should have said it myself earlier, but so thanks for bringing all of that up. But the... Uh, it's being more inclusive across the board at every level. So in the research team, being more inclusive means uh, employing some of us here who are experienced part of the process already and moving that forwards and bringing more people in. It's being more inclusive at the dissemination end and all the stuff Brett was talking about. and people on the periphery, a lot of people don't wish to be researchers but do want their voice heard in a way which is respectful and not manipulative, doesn't misrepresent them. So at every level of the research process we can be more inclusive and that's kind of the point. We've got about five minutes left. Um, Brett or Becky, did you want to add to that particular point? Um, just a very quick point which is to say that um, I mean, Abigail, you mentioned it this morning. Participatory research is a very broad church, and I think it's really important that people identify what they mean by that as a starting point. Otherwise, it be it, this is when it becomes tokenistic, I think. Okay. Time for a couple more questions. Yes. The microphone coming to you. Thank you. Um, while we're talking about research, I'm very aware that a lot of research tries to then feed into the halls of power, into government, for example. And from my own observations, very frequently what happens is that researchers do collaborative work. They do this kind of participatory example. Uh, and then by the time it's actually reached the government, someone has decided they don't like it and they're going to misrepresent it. Are there ways that we can work towards solving that as well? Are there particular examples you're thinking of that you want to bring yes, to the Yes, there was one particular piece of work, and I shall not name the organisation, but it's very powerful within the government as a voice of the autistic um, charity community. And they had done a beautiful piece of collaborative work, and one of the big outcomes of that was nearly everyone in the room said they wanted to focus on healthcare. And by the time we were in front of the ministers themselves, healthcare had been dropped completely. <laughs> Sorry, so who was just doing as an the example, dropping? Was it the organisation? The organisation, the, the charity that had set up this piece of work, then decided to ignore the contents. It was interesting, not in a good way. Okay. Comments. That doesn't sound good at all. Um, it's quite worrying. But um, I think there's. Uh, different ways of influencing and it's how research and academia then impacts on the kind of political level and policy level and so on which is very tricky um, and evidence uh, can be misused and abused by lobby groups and uh, utilizing only certain evidence which supports their case and so on um, so I think the, we need to somehow hold all of these bodies to account and the lobby groups, which is extremely hard work for individual activists in this room to do, um, which is a good thing that this new project that I'm working with, uh, with others here on the National Autistic Task Force, which has been set up, um, that's uh, not a research project, it's uh, more of a being productive irritants in terms of policy and trying to shift 
the agenda somewhat. So alongside research, you do need political activism, basically, and groups doing that. Um, I'm glad to see AUK, Autistic UK, reforming, regrouping, growing. Looks like it's getting on track for a, the first time in a long time. And it's uh, things like this may take time, but the more we can uh, push that, the better. Because, um, but as a lobby group, we also have to be careful ourselves of what we're lobbying for and having an evidence base and support for that and not be shouting for things which aren't really uh, worthwhile or not well evident. So we need to work with academics as well and have things tested out. So if something looks promising, not just we want this, but we want this tested and stuff like that should be some of our messages. So we need to be nuanced as well, I think. Just at the end of our time, but cause... Do I'll you be very brief. Uh, there is a problem, I think, that, that some of the, the bigger charities work out their agenda quite a long way in advance. So then when they get to ask the questions, if they haven't quite tilted the questions in such a way that everybody gives them the answer that they want to fill their agenda, they must be in a bit of a quandary. That's just me being a little bit cynical there. Um, but I've seen it, you know, uh, oh, sorry, that's not the subject we're doing this year. Um, so I think that, that if you've got transparency from the outset, we want to find out about X subject, then you're more likely to get X subject found out about. If you just ask questions in the hope that X subject comes up and it doesn't, uh, then, you're, then you have a bit of a problem. So I do, I do think that there is a strength in having so many uh, autistic-led um, organisations coming up and, and advocating and, and pushing agendas and the transparency uh, from the outset means that it would be harder to hide at, at, at the end um, if you get the wrong answers to the questions that you rather misdesigned. Thank you. Ricky or Brett, any urgent last words before we finish? I think um, it can be a challenge uh, whenever I've done things and media have got involved, the message has always got distorted as well. Um, and that's another, uh, another frontier in, uh, in which to consider, I guess, with these things, especially when they get up to the level of doing policy and getting public attention. Um, personally, I, I think I've decided I'm just going to blog my way um, <laughs> through my research <laughs> life. Or just, take, just so that I keep control of my message, because um, every time uh, I've seen a, a press release on something I've written, it's just not the message that... I want to communicate. So um, there's, a, there's some challenges there as well, I think. And I think it's relevant to the question of policy because a lot of what people decide to do is based on uh, public attention. Um, so maybe one way forward is to sort of take control of your means of uh, media. Um, Damien wants to jump in. I've just got a very good example of that. I did a blog post for the Huffington Post on the National Autistic Task Force when that was being announced as a new project. And so they put the article up and then I went to share it on social media. The image that came up with the article was a puzzle piece ribbon initially. So I went a bit kind of berserk at sort of this, please remove this as quickly as possible because um, I cannot share the article until you do. So I'm not going to promote or publicize this article I've written for you until you've made this change. So then they did the change on Facebook but not on Twitter and LinkedIn and the others. So I had to go back and do it. But it's, without doing this, people don't know. They think this is the symbol for autism. This is like a child behind a glass pane window and the rest of it. Um, recently, there was an unfortunate thing with Glasgow, I think it was, doing a autism, want to be an autism friendly city. So they put out a call for school children and things to send in designs for a symbol 
So they've got now a puzzle piece symbol of outline of Glasgow, like a map. And so you're going to really disappoint someone by criticising this design. And this is going to be used to say things are autism friendly in Glasgow as a symbol. Another good example of where involving people, uh, no autistic people from the start would have made all the difference. Yeah. I'm going to have to end it there because otherwise I'm cutting into the time for the workshops. But thank you so much um, to all the panel for uh, fantastic contributions. And I know there'll be time for questions, more questions generally at the end of the, of the whole day. Hannah, are you going to say what's coming next?